Welcome everyone. This is uh, Rudy Potenzone. Uh, this is the I2B2 Transmart Foundation's community meeting for October 2020. Today, uh, we're going to cover uh, a few topics uh, shown here and um, open up to have an open discussion at the end. Uh, everyone has the ability to open their mic and if you want to ask a question uh, or uh, put a message in the chat window and we'll, uh, we'll try to get it answered. Uh, right when you ask or soon after. And so uh, let's get started. Uh, Diane, you want to start the first topic, the European Virtual Symposium? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, so I just got off a phone call with our European Planning um, Committee, and I'm really, really excited. Actually, you can go to the next slide, Rudy, um, about the upcoming November 9th. A European meeting. Um, it will be virtual, um, no surprise there. Um, and I will actually go to the next slide and I will mention Sorry. Um, the, the agenda. All right. Um, we have Ulrich um, uh, and um, Andreas from our planning committee on this call. So I'm going to walk through this, but certainly um, Andreas and, and Ulrich, please um, chime in if, if you'd like to. Um, so the meeting will start at um, 10.30 um, Central European time. So it's going to be pretty early for the, um, the U.S. folks, um, at least in the beginning. Um, so we'll start off with a kickoff. Um, again, we always record all of our, our meetings, so you'll be able to, to go back and um, view the um, materials later. We have a number of um, use cases that I'm pretty excited about um, from you know, various uh, players within the European uh, community, as well as um, Becky Stacks from the University of Michigan, um, which we'll, uh, she'll talk about a, a, um, the, a, um, the use of Neptune um, um, at uh, University of Michigan. And I think this is actually an international um, uh, project, so it, it covers Europe. Um, so we've got the four. Um, then we have a section on um, sponsors. I'm thrilled um, to announce that we have um, Axiomatics, ITTM, uh, Dell, Intersystems, and Biomeris, um, which is a company from Italy, is, is now joined as an event sponsor. Um, so it's great to have the backing from, from these folks for this um, meeting. Um, then we have an ontology um, working group, and I, I don't, Ulrich, are you, can you unmute yourself? Can you say a couple of words about that ontology panel? I think it's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, I think it will be because uh, uh, James, uh, Jim and, and Sylvia know each other, and I put in uh, make uh, ontology work for me and make ontology work for me, so it's in a double sense. People want to know how, um, how much effort do I have to take to annotate my data with ontologies, and how does it show up in I2B to Transmart? And which benefit uh, will I have? Um, actually, if we got this ontology support, because we got a lot of questions with our stakeholders, with the uh, you know the process owners, and told why should I put so much effort into ontologies? And I think this would be very nice along the data science pipeline to explain that's why you should do it, and that's um, the, the results you can reuse in your own projects. I think that's very important right now, as you're putting a lot of effort in there. And we got um, maybe last sentence from me. We got a SNOMIT CT license in Germany now. So people are all excited about SNOMIT CT, but have a huge respect uh, because you, you, know, you need this training package uh, for getting um, certified for the foundation level and next levels. So we need some ammunition in order to um, bring people into the ontologies and terminologies. So Lord, while you're still there, can you, because um, the, the next section is the COVID-19 panel and, you know, certainly oh. the U.S. activity is something that Griffin will cover. In fact, he's going to actually talk about some of that today. Um, and then we've got the work that, that Sean's doing. But could you mention um, the, the German and the Italy activities that will be part of that panel? Yeah, I could. Um, so there's very interesting German activities um, coming from the Medic Informatics Initiative, but being much bigger now. So um, <clears throat> the um, German research ministry is, is investing 150 million euros right now until end of March in order to get the infrastructure even better than it was in the network university medicine. And Uli Prokosch is one of the 
PIs um, in this huge effort and <laughs> he's um, rolling out I2B2 transmit containers, <clears throat> I2B2 containers uh, to be more specific um, as uh, data integration centers. And he will, he will show some of the infrastructure, but he will also show what we're gonna do with the research infrastructure. There's a research data platform um, and it's going on with additional projects with uh, certain apps uh, where patients uh, can report their symptoms um, going in there. And I think it's in, in <laughs> very good timing right now because we're expecting the second or third wave, whatever. So um, hopefully all those platforms will be um, up and running when cases are coming in. So that's a very timely issue and we learned a lot from Riccardo Bellazzi because you know they had the very first peak in Italy and he will uh, report as we saw I think in the Boston meeting before um, how they collected the data how the data looks like um, what um, uh, they could contribute actually to the authorities and I'm looking forward uh, to, re uh, to Riccardo telling how they prepared for the second wave it could be really interesting um, to see what we are, how we could prepare ourselves and what medical informatics can contribute. Thank you, Ulrich. And then, um, and then we have uh, Sean Murphy and Jeff Klan, um, that, who just published a paper on measuring the severity of COVID-19 um, in the 4C network. And I think that's some uh, very interesting um, and exciting um, information that, that um, people will be very interested in. And this is, is working with 4C and also working with uh, the, the ACT network um, has allowed them to, um, to put together some, some pretty um, interesting work. Um, and then we'll have, you know, we'll have a chunk of time for panel discussion. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very excited about this lineup of, um, of activities. Um, and then the, the last section, which will um, be late, in, late enough in the day that, that the, the US, um, folks will be able to join um, and hopefully not too late for Europeans um, where we're gonna really talk about the work that we've done with the Dell projects um, and the advances we've made um, work, working with that grant um, and also the roadmaps for both um, uh, Transmart and, and I2B2 um, with, with enough time at the end to really discuss um, you know, what, 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 what's on people's mind. We're gonna have a, um, a survey at the beginning of the meeting and we'll, we'll prompt people throughout the day to, um, to talk about, and we're, you know, this is a European meeting, so we're focused on Europe, although certainly uh, we wanna hear from everybody, but we want people to let us know what, um, what, what they're thinking about, what their concerns are, what their needs are, um, and they'll be able to, um, to submit that in the survey and then we'll show the survey results at the end. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a packed agenda um, but I think it's, it's pretty exciting. And like all virtual events, people will be able to join, um, you know, just at the specific time that they're interested in too. So it's, it, it, it won't take up your whole day unless, um, unless you wanna, you wanna see it all. So, um, so that is European, please, you know, sign, uh, join, uh, register. Um, you can register on our website. Um, we're also posting the Zoom link. Um, so you'll be able to get to it on the, the day of the meeting. So. With that, Rudy, I'll let you move on. Okay, thanks, Diane. So I'm gonna talk uh, for a minute about our COVID-19 datathon, which is coming up um, as part of the uh, Dell funding and uh, in collaboration with Axiomedics uh, and the Open Science Pharma Foundation. Uh, we've uh, started work on um, bringing together a datathon, uh, the, uh, the the project that we've been working on um, has been uh, with, with Axiomatics and the foundation uh, has been to bring together um, a public instance of Transmart uh, that has a series of uh, coronavirus uh, data sets uh, already loaded. These are largely data sets from um, uh, GEO, uh, but these have all been curated and cleaned up and uh, brought into Transmart uh, and made available. Um, these numbers actually are probably a little bit out of date, but we've got around uh, 150 data sets now loaded. Uh, and these uh, run across uh, a, a number of different uh, areas, a few different species, uh, and um, has uh, a lot of uh, RNA-seq data uh, also included. Um, these are um, 
uh, going to are being put on a server on AWS. Uh, and these will be made available just generally, uh, and anyone can come in and take a look at the data sets using Transmart 19. Uh, and um, if you're interested, you know, these are open, uh, freely available, and you can download the data sets if you want to bring it into your own uh, Transmart environment. Um, and then for the, the Datathon, uh, these are going to be um, put together uh, and made available to the teams. Um, and the slide's not advancing for some reason. You know it can do it. So the datathon is set to start. Uh, okay, this this just shows these are all the, the data sets already loaded into Transmart. Uh, you can open these, analyze, browse, you know, do all the different things. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just uh, drill down a little bit and show. Okay. The computer's being weird right now, sorry. And yeah, so yeah, this is just showing you can actually open up the data set and get all the information that's inside the folder. Uh, and this is a, a lot of work by, by Peter Rice um, uh, through Axiomatics, uh, bringing all this data in uh, to the to Transmart environment. So the Datathon is gonna be three days, uh, November 18th to 20th, um, where uh, you can register now for it. We've got about, um, I think about 15 people registered already. Uh, and uh, the goal is that the, the teams will come together, uh, the, the group will come together uh, virtually uh, and then break up into teams of about five people. And then each team will then pick a topic uh, or set this, a goal for themselves for the three days, uh, whether it's uh, looking for new biomarkers or implicating pathways in COVID-19 from the data, uh, other topics of their choice. And once they do that, they will use the resources that we have available, work on the, the project, their project for the three days. And then at the end of the third day, uh, report back to the group um, what, what they've discovered. Um, it's very similar to a hackathon, but rather than trying to produce code, this is trying to actually use uh, the resources that we have to, um, to do analysis on uh, this data that's available. Uh, this is the organizing committee. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, looking at working together and trying to see uh, what other types of um, uh, resources would be good to, to bring together uh, and um, uh, just uh, you know, drag over another screen from the website. You can, if you go to the ITB2 Transmart website, there's a, a growing list of information that's, that's available, uh, including data sets, um, but also all of the Transmart open data library. There's another 350 data sets on various diseases that are available in Transmart. Um, another company that Keith Elliston and I uh, have co-founded called Ingentium is contributing uh, a COVID-19 um, magazine. Uh, this is uh, freely available. Uh, you can see it's a, a we scan uh, the world to find information on COVID and make that available in a magazine format here. And this is all freely available. Um, we also, uh, have created a COVID-19 knowledge graph, uh, which uh, will be available to the, the teams uh, to look at. Um, and then uh, we also are working with Dell uh, Technologies to, uh, to uh, bring their, um, their uh, supercomputer uh, tools to, uh, uh, to the teams. And we're working on what, um, what you know, how that will be able to, how that will be able to be used. And we'll also are working with InterSystems and they have a machine learning tool, which we'll be using. And so more information will be coming here shortly. Um, the plan is to hold uh, a couple of training webinars in the next uh, couple of weeks um, that will go over both the Transmart tools and also go over the data sets that are available uh, in the, um, you know, to the data on uh, participants. Um, if you want more information, the website is on our uh, web, uh, in, in the Transmart, ITB to Transmart web, web uh, site. And also uh, registration is open through Eventbrite, uh, which you can get to through uh, this address. Uh, if you have more information, you can contact me or Keith Elston. Uh, we're happy to give you uh, more information. But um, please, if you're interested in doing any research or know people doing research on uh, COVID and, and are interested in, in using the tools of Transmart, um, please uh, take a look at this and uh, ask them to suggest they come and take a look. Okay, that's all I have. Uh, Griffin, are you ready? Yes, I'm here. 
Just a quick, uh, sorry, quick question. Go ahead, question. Sure. A quick question about the uh, COVID-19 infrastructure. So I just uh, clicked on the COVID st uh, staging infrastructure. Is this something which will be around longer? Um, we could um, use yes. and it because we, we had questions. How does um, Transfer right. 19 look like? Is it stable? How fast is it? Right, right. And I think this would be a great opportunity to share this link. So yes, or absolutely. We're close. Yeah, it's uh, we have the staging area set up. We, we've got everything loaded. We're just now we're we're setting up an AWS instance, so it'll be easy to reach for everyone. So we hope to have that within a week or so. Excellent. That's really uh, good. Or, Thank you. Keith, Vanessa. Uh, yeah. Yeah, all right, this is Keith. So the staging servers, we're still going through all the QC and all the data, uh, updating the curation, etc. Um, so if people want to look through there and get back to us with comments and suggestions, that's great. Um, all this is going to go up on a public server on AWS that will scale for the community need. Mm -hmm. And then all the individual data sets will be in the TM library server. Uh, we'll have one in Axiomatics, and I think we're going to update it to the foundation library server as well. So if you want to download the data sets and integrate them into your own instance, they'll all be there as well. Excellent. Thank so you. it's just, we're not, we're not in release state yet, but if you want to take mm -hmm. a look at the staging server and give us some feedback, that'd be fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, okay. the staging server is not not publicly available yet, but right. I just wanted you guys to take a look at it. So if you want to, you know, give us feedback, um, that's what we're looking for. Okay. Is Peter and, on? And Peter can give you a little more detail. Let's see, Peter, Peter. Yeah. But we we do have. There is a demo. There is a version of tra uh, Transmart nineteen running, Ulrich. So they're in the on the Transmart pages on the website. The, there there is a link to the. Transmart. Uh, Thanks. I, I know, but it's more more exciting with real data in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Fair that's, enough. <laughs> that's the big thing. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, right. You put, put the link in. Okay. I did put in the chat the link to the the current. Okay. State. Perfect. So. Yeah. Anybody so you're welcome to take a look at that, right? All right, and I'll uh, I'll make sure that goes into the into the recording too. All right. Sorry, Griffin. You wanna go? Sure. So I share my screen, or do you want to? Your choice. You, you can do it either way. Um, so we'll go ahead and do this. So um, actually, let me let me share my screen. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about some of the different ways people are using EHR data for COVID-19 research. There are many, many things out there going on right now. I can't possibly review all of them, but I selected a handful of them to show different approaches different groups are taking. The one a lot of you are familiar with because you're participating in it is something called 4C. Um, this was started back in March when Zach Kahane sent an email out to our ITPQ Transmart user group email list and said, who wants to come together for a Zoom meeting to look at what we can do to address the pandemic? That initial call, we had about 100 people uh, amazingly on the Zoom. Uh, many of us were already involved in other informatics efforts related to COVID. Um, so we did not want to build something new. But what we realized is we had this group of people on the phone who are all informatics people, data experts, clinicians, and maybe we can take a, a look into our own local databases and see if we can figure out some uh, interesting findings while we were in parallel working on the more robust informatics infrastructure. So we launched this consortium for clinical characterization of COVID-19 by EHR or 4C project. The sort of four principles that we had move fast and we wanted to see if we can find some early intelligence out of the data rather than the more uh, complex infrastructures that we're building that can get more complete intelligence later. In order to move fast, we had to reduce barriers. This meant running analyses locally and only sharing aggregate statistics, statistics centrally with each other. So putting some case accounts into CSV files and sharing those to a, a shared Dropbox. This eliminates a lot of the IRB and governance complexities that we have in other systems. Share, share, share. We wanted to make sure that we would all as a group, a community on these Zoom calls, be able to look at each other's aggregate accounts and understand all the nuances in the data. As we started going through this, we were learning about all the complexities about dealing with a consortium that involved 200 hospitals worldwide, all the different laboratory units that the sites use, different date formats, 
different policies. For example, in Europe, um, race information isn't collected, whereas in the US it's um, uh, often uh, required. So we had to iteratively go through and work out all these issues. And that was our secret sauce. We engaged the local informatics experts to iteratively improve size data quality through multiple rounds. We're able to understand our data better, improve the quality of it, and trust the results that were coming out of it. And actually only in four weeks, we were able to get our first print, uh, preprint out with 27,000 COVID-19 patients from five countries. We're launching phase two right now where we're running more um, complex patient level local analyses using R, but again, only sharing aggregate accounts centrally to avoid some of the uh, governance barriers that we get in other systems. The initial preprint was um, finally published in Nature Digital Medicine four months ago. As you know, ITBT uses the STAR schema with all the clinical data in a large observation fact table. There's another system out there called OMOP. Um, it's a common data model that has different tables for different data types. Um, it's, uh, OMOP is part of a large organization called Odyssey. Um, many of the ITBT sites are also Odyssey sites. We manage both um, databases at our institutions. They launched a similar effort as 4CE um, around the same time frame, they had a big uh, Zoom-like meeting as well, um, where they assembled um, the uh, uh, experts around the world who are using Odyssey. Um, they uh, did the same kind of approach where they were running local analyses and only sharing aggregate accounts. In the Force E project, we were looking at trajectories of laboratory tests after patients were diagnosed with COVID. The Odyssey, one of their products, they were looking at the diagnoses and medications when they were diagnosed compared to um, uh, previous time periods and actually previous influenza outbreaks. Um, their study was published in Nature Communication. Um, so it's kind of a nice parallel between the 4CE and, and Nature Digital Medicine and the Odyssey's version, Nature Communication. And both the 4CE and Odyssey are working now on more advanced analyses. I think my last Count I took a look, Odyssey has about 43 parallel COVID studies running right now on their OMOP database and OMOP being used in another a number of other initiatives as well. Um, both Odyssey's approach to COVID as well as 4CE involves individual people manually running local queries at their institutions. Um, you can connect these and automate this in some way. So we built the Shared Health Research Information Network Shrine software about a decade ago, it allows federated queries across multiple ITB2 instances. The app network, accrual to clinical trials, connects about 50 sites across the United States with over 100 million patients. Um, the app network has been leveraging its uh, um, tens of thousands of COVID patients to uh, understand the characteristics of that population within the app network. Act and Force CE are very complementary. Um, they're both largely based on ITB2, though there's some OMOP and other things that are in there as well. Um, a lot of us are the same people managing ACT sites as well as participating in 4CE. Um, one of the things that really helped 4CE was that all the work ACT did in developing a COVID-19 ontology for ITB2. And then uh, ITB2 has since then developed a severity algorithm based on those codes. And now that uh, that severity um, measures added into the COVID-19 ACT ontology. ACT also pushed sites to update their data twice a week. Um, that was really important, especially early on in the pandemic when the uh, cases in Boston and other areas were uh, running so rapidly. So we both had an ontology as well as up-to-date data in the ACT network that allowed us to do the 4 e projects. Trinetic is a commercial federated network, has similarities to Shrine. It's largely to support pharma and clinical trials and real world data research. They have about 266,000 COVID-19 patients in their network. And a number of uh, publications have come out of um, Trinetic so far on uh, their COVID populations. So far, we've been talking about federated approaches, either people running local analyses and then sharing just the results centrally, or Shrine and Trinetics, where a query is automatically broadcasted out. N3C is a different approach. The National COVID Cohort Collaborative sites in the US are being asked to send patient level data to a central repository um, that's being managed in a secure enclave through the National Institute of Health. Um, so here, uh, you, you take rather than 
distributing queries out to different sites. Sites contribute their data to this enclave, and then machine learning and other um, types of algorithms can be run on top of that central data set. In addition to the raw data that's being contributed to N3C, they're also using MD clones to generate synthetic data sets derived from that. So they can give access to research, you can give researchers access to the synthetic data set with less security or privacy concerns and giving them access to the actual um, uh, patient data. Uh, an initial paper describing the architecture of N3C came out in Jamia back in August. Open Safely is another initiative where data is pulled together, but here instead of asking different hospital systems to contribute data, Open Safely is leveraging um, a national EHR system in the United Kingdom. So they have that, the company that manages that EHR is able to pull together from its own system 17 million adult patients, and they did a study looking at risk factors in COVID-19. So then N3C and Open Safely are combining data from lots of different sites in a couple different ways. So in summary, this is just a small sample of all the different efforts that are out there looking at COVID. The different approaches based on the research questions and goals. Um, 4C and Odyssey are running local analyses to get some initial results for specific research questions, but there's scalability issues with that. We can't manually run everybody's query for that. Um, we, uh, we move the data into networks like ACT and Trinetics, and that allows individual researchers to be able to run queries themselves. Once you harmonize things across institutions, you lose a little bit of institutional knowledge as you do that. When data is moved into a central repository like N3C or Open Safely, you can do more complex analyses such as machine learning models, um, but you've lost by putting everything into one database, the, the variation that you see across different institutions, the standard of care and patient populations. And then in the N3C synthetic data set, here's a data set that's um, been standardized, cleaned up, and it can be given to a lot of researchers without many of the, the barriers that you get uh, from uh, for giving them patient level data. However, at this point, you've lost a lot of the rare events. So it's a bit of a question on what kinds of research you can do with that data. Um, so that's all I'm gonna talk about here. I think we'll be discussing a little bit more at the European Symposium next month. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Griffin. <clears throat> um, okay. Are there any questions about that? Any questions? Like, yeah, well, if, uh, if anyone has a question, you can open your mic and just ask. No? Okay. Looking forward to the talk then in, in, um, in the European meeting. Yeah, this was, this was quick and a little bit of a surprise. I, I, maybe you could think about it a little bit more. There's a lot of issues that, that come out of this. So, you know, do you, is the federated model that a lot of us are working on better or worse than some of these other approaches? How do all these things fit together? I know a lot of us are very, um, uh, overworked at the moment because we're participating in many of these initiatives at the same time and um, how do we how do we uh, ensure that we have synergy between these and uh, leverage our community in the best way possible <clears throat> okay thank you griffin let me skip down here through the slides Okay, so now I'm going to invite Jeff Klan to just give us a quick update on the SAML project. Hey, um, you don't even have to go to the next slide yet because that gets into technical details. So I'll just okay, chat, for, chat for a go moment, ahead. I think. Good. I'm, go for it. <laughs> I'm Jeff. I am presently the uh, director of core development for I2B2. And um, sometime over the summer, a bunch of the community got got together and started voicing, well, we'd really like to have SAML authentication in I2B2. Um, for some people, it was a they needed this in order to participate in any I2B2 projects, including ACT, because their institutions did not allow um, you know, the kind of uh, single um, 
the kind of separate database sign-on that ITB2 generally supports. They needed a single sign-on that their institution supported. So we, uh, this is a very, very like community grown project, which I've really enjoyed. So we, we started these meetings um, early in the summer and a bunch of people would get on these calls and, and we got a lot of, I learned a lot about SAML and, and how it works and how it's different than other single sign-on providers and how it, um, you know, how it could enhance ITB2. So for those who don't know what SAML is, is it's uh, when you, when you're at your institution and you try to log into something and it redirects you to like an Okta page or a Shibboleth page or something that, that is probably a SAML authentication. It's sending you to a single sign-on provider where your institution manages the sign-ons and then it sends you back to the application with a, with an authentication token that says you are, you are signed on now. And, um, and this the, the SAML protocol in particular is one that ITB2 doesn't presently support. So we started looking into how we could support this. Um, so actually the next slide would be great now. So the IT, ITB2 actually for many years has done some of this uh, authentication provider support. So when you log into uh, the web client or any other ITB2 client, but the web client's the most common, it sends, your login request to um, something called the project management cell, which many on this call are familiar with. It's the component of I2B2 that handles authentication. And usually the project management cell just checks against a database and, um, and tells you whether you know, this user has access. But you can also use a security authenticator. And uh, the security authenticator is able to um, validate against, it used to be NTLM v1, now in version 12a, it supports NTLM v2 or Okta. Um, and, and Okta can use SAML, but it doesn't have to. So, um, so we got to thinking, well, can we just use this mechanism to support SAML for provider institutions that need it? And we came up with a much more complex diagram, which I simplified, but uh, you know, it has been annotated with many, many details on how SAML works, and it's, it's been a very interesting learning process. But let's go to the next slide. So this is what we'd like to do. Um, let me walk you through it with the numbers. So starting at number one in the upper right, the, uh, I'll get a little echo from somewhere. Uh, I will keep talking. Maybe it'll go away. Oh, it did. Thanks to whoever muted. Uh, so a user, the person in the upper right is a user. So the user logs into the web client following that first arrow. Um, that, and that's what happens now. The change, the first change is that then there, there would be a redirect to the SAML service provider. And this is different than using NTLM because it's a web-based thing. There's a web-based um, authentication engine. So we'd have to build some kind of web technology. And you can do this with the tool um, in the Apache web browser called Mod Shib, um, which we've been talking a lot about on these calls. And the service provider is like the local thing that uh, tells SAML, um, I'm, the, the, the user is saying, SAML, I want to log in through my institution. And so the SAML service provider communicates with what's called a, um, an identity provider, a SAML IDP. And that is the institution's uh, component of SAML, that would be like your, your Okta or your, I believe your Shibboleth or something that's, that's running at your local institution that manages authentications. Um, that, uh, that allows you to log in, validates that your login's okay, um, returns a token back to the service provider. And then there's been a lot of discussion what to do with that token. So we can, uh, there are ways to get the token directly to I2B2, but it seems like the better way to do it is to just um, have the web client redirect back. So this would be arrow, or we did arrow three and four, now we're on arrow five. Um, so the web client will just tell the PM cell, well, they logged in with SAML. And then the PM cell will reach back out to the SAML IDP and validate that there, there actually was a login and that the, the token actually, there is a valid token there. And then the PM cell will do whatever it does right now, which is issue its own session token and authenticate against the, the I2B2 API. And um, so this is kind of the proposed architecture, but actually um, there's a project at MGB that is, was an institution specific, but built on I2B2 to do a lot of this. 
So it gives us kind of a code base we can use that we can build from that will provide a lot of these features. There's also some work that Bill Rydell did at uh, in California that um, will also provide some some code to to build from. So now we have so at this point we've had all these discussions. We have code we can build from, and the next step is uh, we have uh, someone on the team at Pittsburgh who is setting up a sample IDP that we can hit from anywhere, or maybe it'll be installed on our local machines. It, it, in some way, it won't be tied to the um, commercial service provider uh, so that we can test this thing and different developers around the country and the world can, can test this as, as, we, as we hone it. And so that's the next step. And then, then we'll start trying to integrate some of this, these code snippets that we've gotten back into the I2B2 platform. And so, um, and, and then, and then eventually, eventually, we want to um, when these changes are made to the to the I2B2 PM cell, we want to uh, incorporate this into the Shrine client so that you can do single sign-on through ACT, um, and that is something that Bill Simons and the Shrine team is is leading, um, well, and Griffin as well, uh, and and that's something that we hope to see down the road a bit um, and then there's there's a there's a motivation to also put this into transmart so the transmart can also take advantage of this this uh, single sign-on in the pm cell so this is actually kind of the an exciting feature that is is uh coming together kind of organically that looks like it'll get incorporated um into 13 or somewhere some release coming soon at some point and uh it's been exciting to to be part of this um so one more slide Please, Rudy. And it's just it's just an advertisement. So come, come to our little work group meetings. Right now they're Fridays for a half hour, starting a little after 1.30. Um, there's a Zoom link. You can quickly uh, take a screenshot of that, or I'm sure these slides are available, or you can email me. And um, yeah, just drop in when you can and, and join the discussion. Uh, so thanks for that chance to to give an update on this fun project. So hey, thanks, Jeff. Go ahead. Uh, is the code for this SAML work uh, pushed anywhere? Yeah. So the 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 only code that that exists is the code that was developed at MGB and and at um, and by Bill Rydell in California. So there is no like code. There is no branch of I two B two that does this yet. Uh, but there, there are these sample code things. I, I do have it um, pushed to a place that is available on the internet, but I didn't, I haven't spread the word everywhere because it's kind of rough. And I don't want to like confuse people and stuff. So if you are interested in that, well, drop so me a message and I'll, maybe, I'll send maybe, you the. Maybe someone can help. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, so if you want to help, um, come to this meeting because everyone on this meeting has those links. Um, and if you if you want to just look at it yourself without coming to the meeting, then just drop me a note and I'll send you the link. Uh, that sort of leads into another question I had um, concerning I2B2. Uh, what is the best path for contributing code to specifically I2B2 core server? We at KOMC have had a pull request that's been open for a while on GitHub. Oh, well, that's too bad. Um, we Yeah, the pull request is a great way to do it. Uh, we don't we aren't monitoring the pull requests all the time, so some can get lost a little bit. Uh, we did try to uh, clean those up and go through them before we released uh, 12 at the beginning of this year, but it, we probably haven't been monitoring it too much. The best way really is to submit a pull request and then email one of us, so me or Mike Mendez would probably be the best two people to contact. But um, now that I know about it, I can take a look at your pull request. Okay, thanks. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> okay, any other questions for Jeff? Okay. Um, so that's that those are all the topics we were planning to cover today. Um certainly open to any questions uh, anyone has. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question or put it in the uh, chat window. Hey, Rudy, it's Diane. I just want okay, to Diane. I just want to make a comment about um, the work that uh, Jeff is doing with the, the SAML group that 
that group sort of started organically, and I think um, I think it's a really uh, good example of of how the community can work together and contribute and and um, and really make some progress. So certainly, if if people have other ideas, and you know, we, and we can't we can't go after every you know unique thing that everybody needs, but when there's when there's a common because um, this is something that, that a lot of people have, have been talking about, something like this that pulls a lot of people together. I think um, we, should, we should really, you know, uh, people should reach out and, and we, should, we should do more of this. Okay, any uh, other comments or questions from anyone? I, I um, just wanted to comment on the on the assembly project. I think this is from <laughs> utmost interest um, concerning all applications that people uh, can log on, uh, that you can control them, because more and more uh, we are going into regulated areas, uh, including ethics commissions and the like. And so you need some kind of audit trail. Who did see the data? Who did uh, do what? Uh, that you can put restrictions on, on using it. I think this is um, really, really important to go in those um, areas, maybe a little bit more remote from uh, pure research, including um, data ethic commissions are concerned with. So I think, that, um, yeah, we should do um, have a close look at more of those uh, regulation things. That I'm thinking about audit trails. So there was a question we had um, on getting you know, certification for clinical trials. Uh, so people are in, in validation are always asking the same questions, like the, um, the role management is very important. Next thing they always ask is, do you have an audit trail? Are there dangerous transactions uh, you allow with your applications? <laughs> and, uh, and how do you control that? So maybe not in the main line of the I2P2 transport agenda, but also questions we're getting more and more. As we proceed with real world data, especially EHR data, where you have to have consent or another legal foundation you're operating upon, it, um, yeah, might be interesting for the roadmap a little bit further away. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, are, are you are you talking about putting more governance controls into into the code? It's, it's not the, the code. So we had a, a um, <clears throat> severe questions with the concerning the, uh, so I'm heading the interoperability working group of the uh, German project. So, <clears throat> and they all, you know, they had some um, bricolage, some little, uh, they're checking the infrastructure and then there came the point where the ethics commissions were involved. And then the, the tough questions are coming. When do you get the real data? What are you doing with it? <clears throat> and I think it would, would be good to have a um, close look at the security cell. There was always one in, in I2P2 and we get some basic uh, security features in uh, Transmart as well. But may, maybe it's just my perception uh, coming from the security area and uh, always asking why can't we connect it to our identity provider right away. Um, I see this coming and I think it's not a single voice. Also, my comment from my side uh, is Serge from uh, ITTM. I fully agree on these comments because this is really a need. But also, we encountered similar questions and uh, problems. I'd be curious to, to know a little. On. Yeah, I'd be curious to know a little bit more about the exact requirements of, of the security. Because I mean, there is some tracing there. It stores login attempts, and um, you can see what queries have been run by different users. So. There is some tracking of these things, but there there might be things that we haven't thought of at all. I, I'm not quite clear on what those are. Yeah, actually, it's very easy. So um, I was as a head of I think uh, Sean knows that. So in in the big uh, EMR systems, there are dangerous transactions like deleting data or downloading huge chunks of data. So there's some kind of risk risk assessment. The people have to do um, using uh, the, those instruments, and then um, you have to show this risk assessment, and they come up with two transactions which are, which are dangerous. For example, in I2P2 or in transplant, it would be download all the data, and you would like to know who it was uh, and when it happened. So those uh, coarse grained uh, transactions, I think that would be a good starting point. Right, right. I mean, for example, in the in the in the PDO request, right, in the in the RESTful request for data, 
those are those are logged in the PDO table, I think, hmm. um, with the person who does it and so forth. Um, so that's one. So I think we have we have auditing for most things. Um, we don't have it necessarily at the patient level. If you if you make a patient set, then of course the patient set gets retained, um, and so you know at the patient level how that you know um, how that translates into what was downloaded through the PDO table. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about, or? Uh, not not patient level because I think there's a threshold between usability of the system <laughs> and, and 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 logging every single transaction because then it's not usable anymore. So I think there should be maybe some help for risk assessment, which are the expensive or the dangerous uh, things. I think it's not really on patient level because usually we're using um, de-identified data, so it's not the issue. But you know the big downloads. I think this is. What, what the ethics commissions are concerned with. Got it. Okay, uh, David, did you want to say a few comments? David, you can un unmute yourself. Uh, connecting. Uh, David Diamond from Dell was going to uh, give us some information on uh, their HPC breakthrough project opportunities, but he seems to be having trouble connecting his audio. I think I noticed David's oh, yeah, yeah. connecting to auto, audio this entire time. Maybe uh, yeah, he's dial he's going to dial in. Just give him one more minute. Um, But he's dialing in. Can I just make a real quick comment? So we send out a, a monthly uh, newsletter um, to, I'm sure everybody on this group gets it, um, to a lot of people that really uh, that talks about the agenda for these meetings and how to connect. Um, and I think with, with all email, you know, some people are looking at that and maybe maybe bypassing it. If you, if you see it um, and you, you have colleagues that, um, you think might be interested in joining? Could you just like forward it to those colleagues and, and um, make sure they're they're paying attention to that? Because I, I have a feeling that this is not getting on the agenda of, uh, or the calendar of a lot of people's um, calendars. So. Okay, this is Dave. Can you hear me now? Yes, hear you. Hear you fine. Shame on me for dialing in. Um, so I just wanted to request that when you're looking at the data thon. Uh, in the use of our higher performance computing uh, in our innovation lab. But uh, to just think about it as something, um, you know, not just with this data thon, but going forward, if there can be some breakthrough projects, or um, if you think about doing federated learning or, or some, some very aspirational things, please look at this data thon project as a beginning. Um, we have approval and it's a priority uh, for our innovation lab to work with the foundation. Um, so I'd like to make sure that uh, I think when we talked with Rudy and Keith about it the first time, I was just to think big. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, David. Yes. Okay, with that, I think we're finished. Um, Dan, you want to wrap up? Yeah, just thanks. I think this was a, a great meeting, and I, um, I, I do hope that we can we can um, attract more people to these meetings. I think there's a lot of information and a lot of synergy across the um, the community. And um, with that, I will um, sign off and and hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks. See you all. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.